tracking the affordable housing crisis through new investment strategy. And this has been a huge problem for a lot of developers, um, for cities, investors, and housing experts. Um, how, how can we get, uh, tackle this problem? Um, so we have an incredible panel here to discuss these new, a new investment idea um, that's fast, cost-effective, sustainable, resilient while offering market returns for investors. Now this is pretty cool and I'm gonna stay tuned. And the moderator we have for this is an incredible woman. Um, her name is Shannon O'Leary. She's the Chief Investment Officer of the St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation. And they have exciting stuff, so I'm gonna let her tell you. So without further ado, please welcome Ms. Shannon O'Leary. Thanks so much, Teo, I appreciate it. So thanks everybody for joining us today. It's lovely to see some in-person faces. Um, today we are excited, as Teo mentioned, to talk about uh, a new fund, uh, basically a social impact fund um, focused on you know, finding other ways to approach the, the financing of affordable housing in the Twin Cities and greater Minnesota. And so, again, as Teo said, my name is Shannon O'Leary. I'm the Chief Investment Officer for the St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation. And I've brought a great group with me. Um, special shout out here to PJ Hill. He is a financial advisor at Wells Fargo and also, oh, okay, got it. <laughs> and also a community-based affordable housing developer. And this is his third panel of the day, so we'll, we'll go easy on you. Um, I'd like to welcome Warren Hansen on the end here. Warren is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Greater Minnesota Housing Fund and the Minnesota Equity Fund. Um, to my left here is Sarah Harris, the Executive Vice President at Aon, which is a nonprofit organization um, committed to creating and preserving affordable housing. And to the far left here, Tim Marks, President Emeritus of Catholic Charities. He also happens to be a former commissioner of Minnesota Housing, and at one point wore the title of Deputy Mayor of St. Paul. So thanks to everybody for joining us today. Um, I actually am gonna call on Tim. Would you mind showing that headline from this weekend's Star Tribune? Because I think it really brings this topic to the forefront. So I'm still one of those who likes to get up in the morning, have a cup of coffee, and get a real paper. I know that makes me a dinosaur a little bit but very few times has housing made it above the fold as a major headline in the Star Tribune. And yesterday, housing shortage in these Twin Cities, in this region, is the worst in the nation. Something that I think all of us have felt for years, saw it coming, tried to avoid it, but it is here, it is a crisis, and we must do something about it. And I invite you to learn more, and more importantly, to be involved uh, during and after the session. Thanks so much, Tim. So from the foundation's perspective, and, and I think some of you would naturally ask, you know, why isn't somebody from our grant making program having this, convening this panel and having this conversation with you? I'm coming at this from the investment lens. At the foundation, my team oversees $2 billion worth of assets. And over the last several years, we've really focused hard to align the underlying investment assets with the mission of the foundation. And that involves asking questions along the lines of, when we are making a grant, you know, are there things that we can do in the investment portfolio that could help maximize the social impact of that grant while also earning the kind of market rates of return that we need in order to continue that grant making into the future? And so enter Warren in my life about a year and a half ago. Warren came to the foundation and, and asked us to provide what I would call concessionary capital, so grant money, a program-related investment, or a guarantee to guarantee the investors earning a higher rate of return inside of the NOAA Impact Fund, which is the fund from Greater Minnesota Housing Fund designed to preserve naturally occurring affordable housing. And I looked at Warren and I said, how come you didn't ask me to be one of those guys? Because in my portfolio, that's my mandate. I need to earn that market rate of return. So Warren, how come you didn't ask me? I wish I would have, Shannon. Um, uh, it would have saved about a year. Um, the short story on that is, um, you know, nonprofit organizations like mine, even though we're kind of a financial institution, uh, nonprofits are used to working with program officers or the charitable giving side of a foundation. Like all of us here probably think of the foundation uh, as a charitable giving organization. 
And um, so we kind of honor those relationships and start there. And we were looking for concessionary capital, 2% money to guarantee and support the leverage of about $30 million uh, in a fund, a second fund. This was going to be the second fund that we created. And um, uh, I think that uh, going forward, we have learned a lesson from this experience, which is it's important to talk to uh, different levels of an organization. It's important to talk to the investment side. Uh, and we've learned that from institutional investors of various types, United Health Group, others that we've worked with. If you go to the foundation giving office, the thinking is different. Uh, the thinking is a different scale. When you go to the investment side, it's remarkably larger and at scale. Uh, and so I think we took a, 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 I wouldn't say a hard lesson, but a really good lesson from uh, talking to you uh, and, uh, and learning that, uh, you know, more and more institutions, foundations for sure, and other corporate institutions are looking at how to be an impact investor. And it's kind of up to us to structure those relationships and those uh, transactions in a way that are a double bottom line return, you know, a good, uh, safe uh, economic return, maybe not the most you could ever get, but uh, uh, definitely a good economic return and a double bottom line social impact return. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. yeah, thank you. At the same time that I was having that conversation with Warren, Sarah came into my life and introduced me to the insane inefficiency involved in financing any type of affordable housing, both a new build and a naturally occurring property in order to preserve it. And so I, I had the pleasure of learning that occasionally she has to borrow money from coastal players at 14%, which then makes some of these deals completely untenable and you lose the housing. So as a part of those discussions, it became very clear to me that there were a couple things that were true about housing, or affordable housing in particular. One, inefficiencies mean the market is ripe for change. So how could we address that? How could we create something that might be a much more efficient solution? Number two, it's, it's a, an asset class that has a great deal of strength in many economic environments because there's never enough. When there is never enough supply and there's always way too much demand, that's an asset class that's attractive to an institutional investor because it's stable, it's not volatile, and it constantly cash flows. So that made it really attractive to me. And so I think what happened is we began convening a group of you know, like-minded folks with Warren and, and Sarah and the rest of the crew here and you know, said, hey, what's, what's a structure that we could build where the foundation could earn a reasonable financial rate of return? while also plugging some of these gaps and holes and solving some of the financial issues that the developer community, both for-profit and non-profit, are having. Um, and so the end result here is developing with Warren, so it's kind of a partnership between the St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation and Greater Minnesota Housing to develop this really long-term focused housing impact fund to provide regional housing developers access to a new source of capital for both preservation and production of affordable units. And this is unique in that if we provide a new source of capital, that also means we're not tapping the limited pool of available financing for other properties. So it widens the scope of the, of the, the available financing for developers. So our, our aim here is to provide that affordable capital at scale and it also provides investors who are interested in uh, participating with us a socially responsible investment option that targets a market rate of return. So that's kind of the big level set. Um, and now I'd like to kind of just take a break, go back to the problem. Tim, you have been in the housing, watching this crisis develop for decades. And can you tell us a little bit about how we got here and what other kind of collateral damage we're talking about? Let me speak first to kind of the collateral damage to get everybody engaged in why this is so important. And now or later, I invite you to think about what a safe, decent, affordable home has meant to you. Because I expect for most of us, it simply hasn't been an issue about which we must concern ourselves. 
But think, growing up or now or any members of your family, if they had to worry about that, that knock on the door, you're evicted. You're going to spend the night in a shelter. You're going to be in a car. Or you have to move way out, and you're going to have to uh, invest uh, in daycare and a, a car beyond what your dreams were because you can't afford a house near your job. That is the reality of so many of our neighbors. So let's think about how this has developed. When I kind of started my career uh, in the early 1980s, there was not a housing crisis. The market seemed to function fairly well. But over time, it got worse. It got worse because we didn't invest in it, and there's all sorts of reasons for that. It got worse because we didn't want it near us, uh, and it got worse because, quite simply, incomes of people, particularly lower-income people, and particularly renters, did not match the housing supply and the prices that were increasing. And that developed into the crisis that we have. Now, during the course of my career, I've worked on education, I've worked on jobs and economic development, I've worked on environment, and I've worked on transportation. But none of those other things work well. You're not going to be a good student, a good parent, a good worker. Your transportation system isn't going to work. The environment's not going to get better, and including addressing climate change. All of those things don't work for anybody, including the community, unless there is housing stability for everyone. And we're at a point now where it is clearly a crisis here in the Twin Cities that we need solutions to get to speed and scale and intensity. Thanks. PJ, will you weigh in here? You and I have had some great conversations about just how complicated it is for a community developer to even understand what you need to know. What other gaps, and you know, speak to those knowledge gaps as well. Yeah, thank you. Just to piggyback off of uh, what Tim said, it's, um, I think the number one thing is uh, dissemination of information. You can't even get to the information as a minority developer. So I've been doing development now for about a year and a half. I mean, uh, prior to George Floyd, I started to get involved in it. But after that, I didn't want his death to gentrify our community. And so when I start looking into um, you know, ownership of these uh, multifamily units, uh, bigger units of 20, 30, I started to see that the representation of the community is very low, and for several reasons. Number one, access to information. You don't have enough access to the, to the right sources of funding, to the right people who can help guide you through the process, um, to the right organizations. Number two would be the, the gap of, of um, financing. You may can get a loan, um, but you still have a gap for that down payment that you need. Or, you, you, you see this a lot of times, because of affordable housing uh, doesn't really fit into a banking model, that a lot of these banks will not give you a loan. And personally, most community members don't have that, um, the balance sheet to support some of these projects. Um, so those are some of um, the, the barriers to entry that I have ran into, and there's a lot more, but just to keep it at the 30,000 foot view, um, access to information, and then access to patient capital to help you through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, Sarah, I'd like to know sort of your thoughts on this fund and its place in Anne's environment. Well, that's a big question. Do we have three hours? No. <laughs> um, I mean, it's just, it's simple math, right? Real estate is simple math. And the problem with affordable housing is if we want to keep the housing affordable, we have to keep the rents low. And if we want to keep the rents low, we can't pay as much for our capital as the market rate housing that's out there charging a lot more for rents. It's just simple math. And so when we're trying to keep our rents low, it creates a gap in the uh, funds that are available to buy or build properties. And when we're talking about buying properties, the naturally occurring affordable housing that you mentioned, Shannon, the gap is big and our time to address it is really tight because we're competing with those market rate buyers who are going to increase the rents and are going to increase the rents almost overnight. And we usually have 30 days to find our money so that we can compete and buy those properties. And so why does this fund matter? Because it, it's a big enough fund that it has scale that tells us we can go out and start targeting the properties that we think are most at risk to sell to those market buyers. And we know that we have some funds behind us with which to do it. 
And that gives the seller the confidence that they can work with us and not lose their opportunity to sell. And so having this fund will completely be a game changer for our ability to go out and preserve this housing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about how you approach planning next targets for Aon right now and how that approach might change with this available pot of money. Right now, it's very reactive. We look at the properties that are being brokered. They're already up for sale, and so we quickly have to go to cities. We go to Warren. We go to any source that we know is interested in preserving affordable housing, and we say, can we collectively pull enough money together to respond in the next 30 days? That will change when this fund exists because we'll be able to say, all right, we know we have some capital. Again, what are the properties that are most at risk of, of being sold? We can start building relationships with those legacy owners. We can start talking to cities and counties about where they are seeing the most likely targeted properties for sale. And we can go in and start building the relationship before perhaps that seller has even thought about selling. And before, with all due respect to brokers, I am one, before we get brokers involved and the price of the property has already been driven up by all of the market research that that broker has been doing to entice the seller to sell. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes we can build the relationship with the seller, help them to understand that they will ultimately come out with a very similar bottom line, but in many ways their legacy will continue because the residents that have helped their property to be successful can stay in that property. Yeah, and I think it's critical too for the audience to know that a lot of these affordable, these naturally occurring, in particular affordable properties in Minnesota and the Twin Cities are owned by individual human beings whose lives and decision making comes at us at random. So you, Aon is fundamentally in the catch position all of the time. You're not able to plan ahead. Um, and I think that, that building those relationships with those individual humans over time, because most of them care about the legacy of the affordability of that property. Can I just add quickly to this mm -hmm. too? Uh, our consciousness about the importance of this naturally occurring housing really came to a uh, bright light back in, I think it was 2015, when a large property in Richfield sold and almost overnight 698 families were displaced. And then all of a sudden the schools were saying, hey, wait a second, what happened to our students? And the local economy was saying, what happened to our workforce? Well, those people had been scattered to the winds. And so it took not only those families time to restabilize, but it also took the community a lot more resource and a lot more time to restabilize. So it's in our best interest collectively to be doing this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, thank you. Warren, I think maybe level set for us a little bit on the continuum of affordable housing. I just want to make sure that folks are clear on, you know, sort of market rate versus... Yeah. Uh, so in the, in, in the housing field, I think in the private sector field and in the affordable housing field, we think of the housing continuum as starting with shelter, if you will, very basic emergency shelter, and then moving up to stable rental housing, or maybe supportive housing with services, and then stable rental housing that would be subsidized, then more market rate housing, or what we commonly call now workforce housing without subsidy, and then to home ownership. So you can kind of see it's a progression based on the incomes. As the incomes increase, the, uh, the uh, uh, type of housing kind of morphs more into a market rate part of the spectrum. And this fund will finance, as Sarah and everybody's been saying here, the naturally occurring affordable housing and the new workforce housing. So two types of housing are, are definitely in the game here. And I just want to um, uh, have you use your imaginations for a second. When Sarah talks about the Crossroads Project in Richfield, 700 units of housing that was flipped in about 45 days, displacing those 700 families, but that was about 1,200 people who were scattered. And uh, Aon has now, with us and with other investors, preserved 3,000, maybe going on 4,000 units of that kind of housing because of this kind of intervention. But the capital is the key. Mm -hmm. It's also the key to producing new workforce housing without subsidy. And we have determined that this is happening. It's just not happening enough. You know, consider the headline over there that Tim showed. And so by giving these uh, for-profit, non-profit developers access to um, lower uh, cost, market rate, uh, capital, they know that they can take a risk. They know that they can plan a project 
uh, in advance and go ahead and develop it. So uh, naturally occurring affordable housing and new workforce housing are kind of right there in the middle of the housing continuum. It's not the luxury, it's not the home ownership, it's not the shelters, it's not the uh, deeply subsidized. And frankly, it's forgotten right now. We're losing ground, we're losing, some estimates are we're losing 6,000 units a year statewide. And the state of Minnesota, with all of its subsidy sources, as PJ was talking about, tax credits and so forth, can produce a little over 2,000 units a year. So we're sliding backwards. So the big aha for us in the housing field is we need to act actively preserve this lower cost, naturally affordable, market rate housing, or we'll never catch up. We'll never keep up with the demand. Mm -hmm. Can I just add a quick thing here, Shannon? And we keep talking about this in, in kind of global terms, but we need to remember when we're talking about affordable housing, we're talking about the very people we've spent the last year and a half talking about, all of our essential workforce, the people who are retail workers, the people who are teachers, first responders, you know, the folks that need to keep our community, that we need to keep our community active and vibrant and healthy, and where are they going to live if they don't have housing that they can afford? And, you know, to move further and further out so that they can afford to live in housing makes every other part of their living equation more expensive. The further out you are, the more you have commute time, which takes away from your time with your family. There are so many mathematical ways that we can talk about this, but at the end of the day, it's the people we need to keep our community vibrant need affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, great. PJ, as a developer, and you're thinking about this fund coming into play, from your individual community developer perspective, how does this change the game for you? This changes the game big time. I mean, just to piggyback off of what Sarah said, um, when we talk about the ecosystem, I was, I'm a product of affordable housing. And my uh, parents were lucky enough to move from workforce housing into buying their own first home. And so to start creating generational wealth for the community, but it, it, it's an ecosystem that um, we need to continue to move. And I think as this fund, what it excites me about this fund is we need to shift uh, corporations, foundations need to shift for doing things for community to doing things with community. It's a co-creation, it's a co-investment that we all are gonna benefit from. And so when we talk about investing in community, not doing philanthropy, but investing at a social impact uh, level and um, almost as a bond replacement, then what we do is we affect people's lives on so many different levels. Like Tim had us, um, alluded to earlier, you cannot have a, a good job, you cannot get a great education if you, number one, don't have stable housing. So this impacts so many people. And we talk about uh, the, the communities that uh, a lot of these corporations and foundations serve. Um, these are the people that they serve. And so for me as a community member, being a community developer, to have this gap funding to be able to serve my community and then in turn not only serve it in, in, in a, uh, a, a data point way, but to also serve it in a way that where I can be a beacon of hope for some of these young people, where I can be um, a person that is able to afford them an opportunity who looks like them, and then for them to also change the narrative for them and their family, I think this is the starting point. This fund mm -hmm. can really do a lot of things like that. Great. Great. So Tim, I'll turn to you again from kind of that public policy lens. Does a, a fund like this or a consortium of people that are involved have an outsized influence potentially to attract kind of the lack of government interest that we've seen? One of the things that I've learned over the course of my career is of the importance of public-private partnership and how the private sector, uh, seeking a rate of return, seeking to benefit uh, the shareholders in the community, sometimes comes up with those innovations that spur government into action. And this is a case where an idea has come up that if government works smart and works fast, can help get it to scale. One, because of the dollars it can leverage. Second, because the influence it has in the public and private sector. So a fund like this is something which government should partner with in order to get to scale and also keep it community-based mm -hmm. so that it's not done to people, it's doing 
doing it with people so that it benefits the community. Specifically, government has access to good data uh, and can garner that data. And government, uh, with the veiled threat of perhaps a heavier hand, can get the private sector to say, if you do this voluntarily, we won't have to step in. So we know where these housing units are, or we can find them out. Uh, we can work together in public-private partnership and say, over the next three to five years, we can figure out what, where the market's likely to go, and we can get ahead of it to make sure it benefits our workforce and benefits the community. And I think uh, part of this effort should be to leverage that government power uh, to make that happen. Several years ago, when I was at the housing agency, we met with developers and planners to try to figure out where are you going to be expanding so that we could get ahead of it and buy the land either with them or ahead of them so that we could preserve some of that for affordable housing. That's one example that could be replicated here. Mm -hmm. right. can, can I say something just, just to add to that? And I, and I think that public and private partnership is very important because what Shannon has done and, and Sarah with her organization, it allows you to leverage up the amount of impact you have. So if it's just two organizations and then you match it with um, the, the government, then you match it with uh, Fortune 500 companies, now the impact that we can have on a community, on a society, on our state is leveraged up. So by you guys taking the first step, then you can say, just match us. And then that's how you start to leverage the impact that you have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Warren, talk a little bit about the impact, the, uh, the potential impact the fund can have in terms of leaving the other concessionary dollars in the pot at Greater Minnesota Housing? Uh, well, that will happen because uh, right now, in order for us to provide capital to affordable housing, we have to go get charitable dollars or federal and state government funding. And we've done that, and we've done a pretty good job of it, and we've grown you know, uh, and, and become a substantial or at least a very stable uh, community development financial institution. But we can't grow to a new level of scale and impact without private sector capital markets resources like the St. Paul Foundation can offer. And so um, uh, in the future, what we're hoping to be able to do is to this fund, for example, would preserve or acquire and produce uh, almost 4,000 units of affordable housing. Now, we have never been able to do that in a single year or even in a five-year period at our organization. The state and combined, everybody else, uh, you know, gets up to maybe a couple thousand a year. So this is really a game changer. It's, um, I said this before, but I, I think it's worth repeating, that there just isn't enough subsidy on the planet even with you know, uh, generous uh, you know, uh, uh, elected officials to create the kind of affordable housing stock that we need. And so it's important that we have innovation strat innovative strategies that uh, maybe don't go to the deeper subsidy, but produce the kind of housing supply and preserve the kind of housing supply that, frankly, the majority of people who live in affordable housing are live, living in housing that never had any government subsidy. It's just there because it's uh, part of the housing supply, it's older, and it's naturally affordable today. So we have to both produce that kind of housing so that in the future it's affordable as it ages or maybe even as it starts out, and we just have to preserve uh, the existing supply. So this fund um, will take to scale something that we've been struggling with in Minnesota for about five years. Anne has been leading the way. We've been trying to provide the aggregated capital, and uh, we've done some, some pretty good work on that. Uh, and uh, with the leadership of the St. Paul Foundation, I think that we could see a transformative change in what financial institutions, charitable institutions, and, and, and uh, corporations in Minnesota decide that they can do to have this kind of impact. Mm -hmm. Great. Sarah, how do we attract corporate entities to this, this big venture that we've produced here? 
Well, I mean, we've already talked about this. The need for affordable housing is getting bigger, and this is a big pinch point in the growth of our economy. So it is clearly in the best interest of our local corporate sector to be thinking about how do we eliminate housing as the barrier to growing our jobs. But it's even beyond that. If you, you know, there's the old parable of uh, the babies that are floating down the river and people are pulling them out and then they start coming faster and faster and somebody says, why don't we go upstream and see why they're in there in the first place? Think of the babies down river as all of those things that Tim mentioned earlier that the corporate sector, the philanthropic sector, the public sector are all investing in better educational outcomes, better economic outcomes, better climate change, uh, outcomes, transportation spending, all of these things that we're trying to solve downriver, if we go upriver and start providing affordable, stable housing, we won't have as many people and as many needs downriver. And so it is a social imperative, it is an economic imperative for corporations to start thinking about how do we take a small percentage of what we're doing upriver so that we don't have this continuing exponential growth of need downriver. If I may add a point there. If you look at the balance sheets of corporate America today, particularly some of our even local corporations, they are flush with cash. They are looking for opportunities in which to invest. And if presented with this, perhaps cajoled a little bit, uh, and the innovation and the potential rate of return, given the crisis we have, um, I think that is a tremendous opportunity, but it's gonna take a couple of those first birds off the wire. Uh, and that is something that this fund can inspire. And if, if I could just, we'll just riff off of each other here, Tim. Um, you know, there's sadly has been a lot of trauma in our community in the last year. And I think that there are nationally, uh, the, our corporate sector is saying it is a social imperative that we do things to improve our community. And we need to start looking at more than the economic bottom line. We actually need to be looking at what we are doing for our community, which, oh, by the way, also drives a better economic bottom line. And so they're flush with cash, and I think they're also recognizing that they need to be participating in improving the social fabric of our community in a better way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. You mentioned patient capital earlier in the conversation. I'd love for you to just riff on that a little bit. Yeah. It, um so this is what I mean. I've been investing in, in, in some of the real estate, and you can use hard money, which is like huge interest rates on your money. But when I say patient capital, it, it's what we're talking about up here. Somebody to come alongside you who understands the vision, who understands the community and what we're dealing with. So the, the cultural residency part um, uh, and understands the, the landscape and then is willing to walk with you um, the distance it will take to really impact the community and really change the landscape. And not everybody has that vision, but I think uh, because of COVID, uh, because of the unrest, I think a lot more people's eyes are open to um, having, having patience with, with the community and how we need to deal in, in these spaces. A lot of the times, uh, the, the communities that we serve with this affordable housing are underprivileged. So how do we get them up to speed? How do we invest in areas and build trust and transparency along the process to really impact and make a difference in our community? So you need patience to do that. It's not an overnight thing. Um, so how do we swim, swim upstream like we're talking about and then understand that this is a three, five, 10 year process and don't expect us to displace people along this way, but how do we work with people to really change the narrative? I'd like to just tag on to what PJ is saying there, just to put some numbers on it. Uh, PJ talks about the three, five, seven year kind of window. Uh, I would say, and Sarah can vouch for this, that the capital markets and the investors, and definitely the speculators that are out there acquiring these properties and flipping them, what that means is they're acquiring a, an asset, and within three years, they're gonna sell it. Uh, they're going to release it. They're going to raise the rents. Now, maybe they'll hold it for five years. Maybe they'll hold it for seven years. But the reason they're going to do that is to optimize the value to them. You know, they're going to continue to bump the rents. They're going to continue to keep the occupancy up there. Um, and, uh, and, and then they're going to ride speculation. And then the second marshmallow is there. They're going to cash in. And what this fund is designed to do and this is, I, I can't even overemphasize how important this is. 
by having a fund that's willing to go the long term, to ride along with the uh, community, uh, to stabilize these uh, neighborhoods, really, not just that one asset, but the neighborhood, um, and keep gentrification from, from just occurring rapidly, um, the fund is designed to have long-term holds, up to 30 years. Now, I have to, I, I didn't expect to hear this from Shannon O'Leary, the CIO of the St. Paul Foundation, when she said that that's what we're interested in. I almost fell off my chair because we've never f had an investor that, I mean, you can go to the market and get Fannie Mae first mortgages for 30 years, but that's, that's not this money. That's the money that everybody can get, doesn't matter. The gap is the equity and the mezzanine or the investment capital that, um, that's being talked about today. And so the long-term hold is the key to long-term stability for the property, for the tenants, and for the neighborhoods that these properties are, are um, located in. And, and the patient capital doesn't always, um, it produces a monetary return, but a social return that every corporation, every foundation, every uh, member of uh, Minnesota, Minnesota is going to impact from. It's going to be a ripple effect, and that's why we talk about uh, the ecosystem. Everybody stands to benefit, not only monetary, but socially. So I think to wrap up, and then maybe we'll take some questions if there are any, I would just love for each of you to, what's a call to action? What do you believe all those listening today should walk away with in terms of sort of insights or action steps? And I mean, I'll go first. Um, invest your philanthropic dollars with the Community Foundation because that allows us to participate in this type of really deep impact work, tying that grant making to our endowment assets where most of our power lives. This is, we vote in this society, we vote with money. Come help us vote with our money. And then to other nonprofits or large foundations and endowments out there, come along with us. We would love to partner with other portfolio managers or asset managers or chief investment officers like myself in, in pushing this fund forward, doing this more than once, sharing this work beyond our community if, as we get this thing moving. I'll go next. In addition to capital, which we all hope you'll bring to the mix, we also, you know, we're talking to a bunch of innovators. So let's start finding innovative ways to build and to renovate these buildings with technologies that cost less but drive more value to the people who are in these buildings. So innovative construction methods. Tim? I'll go next. Uh, get engaged. Uh, because so many of get engaged in so many issues. This one sometimes takes a little bit more work, but they'll be returned to you in the community if you get engaged. Uh, and then invest and donate. Uh, as you get engaged, you'll want to learn more. That'll allow you to, to be a part of the innovation. And then finally, consider putting some of your personal time volunteering with one of these great organizations where you get to know the people who really need this and the value that it brings to them of a safe and decent affordable home. And then I'll go next. Um, uh, piggyback off engagement, um, I would like all young people from the community to um, be and look into being developers to take ownership of your community and how do you help change the narrative. And because of funds like this and access to people like us, we want to help you have ownership and take back ownership of that community and really make it a thriving community. I would say think about uh, the fact that we're not none of us are able to do this alone. It takes a collaborative approach. It takes a lot of uh, mutual trust uh, and partnership and by working together we can do something that we can't do alone. Now that's the key, that's been the key to everything that I think any, anything great that's happened. It's definitely been the key to the existing affordable housing ecosystem that Tim talked about. We have a great ecosystem in Minnesota of a lot of affordable housing developers, state uh, agency that's remarkable, bipartisan support for affordable housing. And, and that's all been done in a very collective, very uh, cohesive, well-aligned, grand alliance, if you will. We can do the same thing with market rate, missing middle, you know, uh, workforce housing and, no, and naturally occurring housing. And n I would say in the last three, four years, because of the work that Ann has done primarily and our ability to support them and others too, it's, it's, 
people are more aware and cognizant of, of what that opportunity really is. And we can do it. I think, you know, this, this kind of capital will be galvanizing. And it will be a beacon, I think, for other investors. So as investors, if uh, uh, you are looking for a platform or a vehicle, this is one of those vehicles. Great, great. Well, I will wrap it up here. Are there, are there any questions? A little quiet from the room. But thank you all for uh, coming to listen to us. And thank you to this fabulous panel, Warren, PJ, Sarah, and Tim. I really appreciated your time. And if folks have questions about the work that we're doing, um, we have a page up on the St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation uh, website. It is spmcf.org slash housing fund. And thank you, Shannon, for being a game changer at the foundation, too. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Applause for Shannon O'Leary. Yes. Her leadership. Thanks, everyone.